But I really want you to ask yourself, did I fail you as a creator? Or did y'all fail me as followers? Let's talk about creepy guys, shall we? Yeah. Welcome to war mode. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. Tell me how I should be. I don't know. I don't care about nothing, okay? You're all I need in life. It's all in his. It's all in his. Get off of me. He just teasing the tension, baby. I can't help. I'm a good looking motherfucker. Do you feel like you're sitting across the table from your husband? No. Yeah, me either. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Whitney Webb. I'm an investigative journalist. Ain't no turning back now. They gonna respect us. They don't hate us. I like you, girl. I like you more than life, nigga. That's really the death, you hear me? Uh, yeah, no problem. Is there uh was there just a fire down there? Uh yeah, there still is, I think. Well, like every summer in Chile lately, past several years, there's been a lot of fires in summer because it's you know southern hemisphere, so it's summer here now. And um the current fires are like north of me. I mean, they're near like um uh, they're in Valparaiso, which is by Santiago, the capital, which is like the middle part of Chile. Chile's like a really long, skinny country, you know, in like the middle bit is where most of the people live. And so it's like a really crowded area, coastal area. Yeah, we just it's realized getting, uh, it's not under California. Right now. It like blew our mind that Chile's way past us. In front of us in the time zones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's weird because it's like a Pacific coast country. But yeah, it's like two hours ahead of Eastern time right now. It's all yeah. very weird. It's because Chile and the U.S. both have their own daylight savings time. So it's like super... That's uh, odd, I think the president just got killed in a car in a plane crash or something, right? Former yeah. president, yes. Um, he, I never have liked him at all. Uh, he was president of Chile during COVID, uh, and responsible oh, he's like for a all the guy? insane lockdowns and vaccine mandates here, which led Chile to have like the highest uptake of the vaccine, one of the highest vaccine uptakes in the world, and then definitely the highest vaccine uptake for kids. As young as two. Well, oh, good. Yeah. So I'm really. not a fan of that guy. And his whole political career uh, has been about, like, selling Chileans out uh, to, like, foreign corporations. Yeah. And he's, like, one of the main oligarchs of Chile also, or was, I guess. Uh, like, he owns how um, this, this thing called Red Compra, which is, like, how debit cards function. It's, like, credit card and debit card processing. Uh, one of the biggest supermarkets, one of the biggest airlines, one of the biggest uh, department stores. I mean, he's industrious. South America is weird. Dude. <laughs> industrious. Yeah. Yeah. Also like a, a corrupt uh, piece of shit. But, um, you know, I mean, he's I sort of see him as like a Chilean George W. Bush. Right. He's like very much in that same vein. Also with like the Bushisms, you know, where like he just says like dumb shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pinera was also known for that. And for, like, trying to, like, you know, just walking normally and randomly, like, falling down, kind of like Joe Biden, but, like, not as senile, you know? Right. Yeah, <laughs> he's getting pretty rough right now. I'm, yeah, Biden's been The videos right are, like, kind of confusing as to how. It's crazy because that dude, like, I don't know if it's, like, an act or something because, like, we went into, like, the Hunter Biden laptop and stuff. And, like, the amount of shit that guy has going on as far as, like, kickbacks and, like, oil companies and stuff. It's, like, Yeah, amazing. it's wild. Like, is that yeah, it's wild and, and none of it happens. It's been like kind of like normalized, like, oh, nothing to see here. Just like Joe Biden's like weird sign senile, like, I don't even know what to call them anymore. I mean, people call them gaffes, but they're not really gaffes. It's just like, you know, um, Alzheimer's grandpa escaped from the place where we <laughs> try and keep him locked up, you know. Yeah. Um, well, Hunter ended uh, up hiring Louis Free, the dude from, he was like a judge. Yeah, the, yeah, the F, the former FBI director under Clinton who uh Is that like, the dude with the eye? hangs out with Alan Dershowitz and stuff. Yeah. That's why I don't mm -hmm. think they care if Biden looks like all like retarded and stuff, because 
in in they real don't. life, like I don't think Iran Contra ever start, stopped. Like they've just found Kiev weapons in Mexico. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, Iran Contra was just like a phase of what has been like a decades long arms and drug trafficking thing involving, you know, U.S. and Israeli and some other intelligence agencies. Right. So that's always gone on. And it's also like a big thing for money laundering. I mean, like Afghanistan was like a huge, uh, you know, if, if you look at it as like one long event, not like all these separate disparate scandals, you know, uh, Afghanistan and Iran Contra are kind of like similar in that vein. In yeah, like it of, never like, ends. It right. Yeah, absolutely not. Because it's like the biggest grift. I mean, well, it's like rackets right so if you're like me and you view these guys as basically an extension of like organized crime from like the 20s and 30s uh how does organ how did like the mafia then work they had like rackets right and the purpose of the racket is to expand the racket and like keep it going for as long as possible and um all of these interests sort of come together with arms trafficking with um arms and drug trafficking and in order to enable that activity and make it profitable you have to launder vast amounts of money yeah i, so I, I was those showing things always go together i was showing bill the um there's a bbc thing on uh maxwell called house of maxwell and it's like he had an arms racket he had like all this shit dude mm-hmm. i don't understand they like don't it. bbc is just like oh dude he's a media guy here's his kids but they don't show like it's insane the level like in whitney's yeah. book they she goes into like how there's people from the Maxwell family that were like in the Hillary Clinton State Department. What? It's like Ghislaine's sister's kid. It's nuts, yeah. dude. Christine, uh, no, it's Isabel Maxwell's son. So Ghislaine's nephew was running the Middle East desk at the State Department under Hillary. Mm-hmm. I just That's like, wild. When I'm watching that, is that kind of like uh, the Epstein thing on Netflix, like Filthy Rich? Like, is it that much of a limited hangout that uh, the Ma- has some Maxwell? Because I don't understand, Absol- like. Dude. All of these dudes come from Skettles somehow, and then immediately <laughs> it's like, oh, I bought the mirror. It's like, how the yeah. fuck do you go from being in, like, a little tiny hut to owning the mirror and literally recording fucking everyone? Yeah, you you join the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what happens. Um, you know what's nuts? Yeah. Like, that um, it's in your book. I mean, I'm sorry to spurg about your book, but I just read it. <laughs> it took me, like, a month. It was an incredible feat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it not happen. short, so... <laughs> But, uh, no so, like, everybody talks about, like, Epstein, and then, you know, like, his house in New York. They will show pictures of this. Yeah. Dude, he was renting a house from the State Department back when, like, Clinton was president. Where? For 15 Gs a month. George Bush, Bush Sr. was president. Oh, sorry, Bush Sr. Bush Sr. Yeah. was president. But it was through Clinton. Yeah. yeah. Totally. It was 15 grand a month, and it was on, in, on 69th Street in uh, New York. Dude, what the like? Like, dude, for it years he was running. It used to be the home this. of the of the uh, consulate for e- Iran, yeah, and but- they gave it to Epstein. At, at the same time, Epstein was starting the the sex blackmail stuff. Yeah, so they're like, the oh, look at where, like, like here, who's take it? This, <laughs> this is but way before VH1 was like, check this dude out. Yeah, that was yeah. a weird thing VH1 did. I just like. Does anyone know, like, what, like, he was just working at the Dalton School and then slowly started blackmailing people, or like, how did that dude come online? Yeah, it, 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 he got into banking. That's how it started. He's so smart. But, He's like, like, I could get into banking, and, like, I would just work at TD probably for the rest of my life. Dude, you know what's weird? Yeah, is they but the do, thing is, oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. You're good. They do this, like, great Gatsby thing with him where they're like, he can play piano. He's this, like, super genius, but he never even graduated school, bro. Yeah. He never graduated from college, and he was, like, enmeshed with these, uh, this network that, was responsible for his rise, right? Uh, since like the early seventies, it seems to have happened sort of in this, like around 1971, he went backpacking in Europe and then is hanging out with like, you know, really fancy people over there Yeah, in London being like this college dropout that just went to backpack in Europe. So, so obviously cool. something weird was going on. <laughs> like, um, so cool, dude. <laughs> yeah. And then he's hanging out at, um, Jimmy Goldsmith's house. Who's one of these sort of like, um, uh, corporate raider tycoon style guys sort of in the same vein as Maxwell definitely in the same like social milieu as Maxwell they were members of this thing called the Claremont Club which is Dude, um wild. it's in some BBC Adam Curtis documentary um forget which one 
but just talking about how these like corporate raiders just picked off uh, in consolidated control over like big parts of of the economy in, in Britain. And Maxwell's one of them. And, and this Goldsmith guy's one. And Epstein's just there like playing piano in like 1973 or something like that. Yeah, and hanging there's like out with all these wealthy people. And Jimmy Goldsmith is like a cousin of the Rothschilds. He's like very connected to the royal family and stuff. And so like, how did he get there? How was Epstein hanging out with this fancy um, violinist uh, who was like sponsored by the queen and stuff? And, and this is all like in the early 70s. So like even before the Dalton School happens, like weird stuff um, is kind of going on. But the way he makes the transition into banking from the Dalton school has to do with um, Ace Greenberg, who used to be the guy that ran Bear Stearns or like ran it for a really long time. Um, and Epstein sort of started working under him before Ace Greenberg was in charge of it because allegedly it's because Epstein was tutoring his kids and was like, oh, Rough he's tutor. so brilliant. I'm going to give him a job. And then a, like a year or two after Ep he brings Epstein to Bear Stearns, um, Ace Greenberg becomes head of the whole thing. And then Epstein sort of like has this rapid ascendancy within the bank um, and basically starts managing. Um, I don't want to say tax fraud, but that's probably what it is like tax fraud schemes for the um, richest company or richest clients of Bear Stearns, which includes like the Bronfman family and stuff. And actually one of the reasons that he Epstein had to leave is because uh, he was sort of embroiled um, in this insider trading accusation that involves Seagram's, the Bronfman family company. And uh, pretty much everyone that was charged with that never actually like was prosecuted. They like either fled the U.S. or were never actually arrested. And Epstein um, just left the bank and then, you know, became this international financial consultant uh, that was doing all this weird spooky stuff and started getting pa multiple passports um, applying for multiple passports, traveling all over the world, allegedly being involved in weapon stuff that wasn't necessarily part of I Iran Contra, but like sort of parallel to it. Um, uh, allegedly, it was selling weapons to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So, you know, Iran Contra involves mainly like arms trafficking involving Iran despite the embargo of the Reagan administration against it. And then also, it had like a Latin American theater in terms of like the drug trafficking aspect of it. But there was also weapons trafficking and stuff. I mean, it was basically an effort to prop up different paramilitary groups and then, you know, bargain uh, with Iran over uh, several different things. And is wrapped up in things like the October Surprise and all this other intrigue Yeah, stuff. the October Surprise um, hurts. They paid $40 million to keep the um, hostages. To tell Iran, like, don't let the Americans go until it's time for the election. For optics. Well, to get rid of Carter. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yep. Yeah. To get Reagan in. And Reagan, dude, it's wild. You'd love this shit. Reagan's connected to, um, like, it's weird. Like, Whitney, like, in your book, like, if I start talking to people, they'll be like, not everything is a conspiracy. Because they think, like, it's a crazy, like, here's a room where people are, like, conspiring and stuff. But really, this is just people that are related to each other and people that work together. And that's all yeah, it is. It's business. Yeah, it's, it's just, just not business. not necessarily stuff. legal business, but they don't let laws get in the way of business. You know what I mean? Like Reagan, like, when, he, when Reagan was a youngster and he was an actor, he got wrapped up in the mob and this dude, Lou Wasserman, and he runs MCA. Mm -hmm. So MCA Records, like all that shit, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. These guys were Which pulling. Which becomes Universal Studios, yeah. Mm -hmm. He pulls strings. Like he's, he's like a kingmaker. He makes the president. Jesus. Yo, Clinton, Carter. Bush or Clinton, Carter, and Reagan for sure. The Bushes might have been kind of goaded in. Yeah, and then, and then like we were talking yesterday about like how like they just got uh like blocked the like the Ukraine or the money to Israel just got blocked. Is that like how do they let that happen? If like they're running the show, like why can't they just send? I mean, all I'm the telling money? you, they'll get their money. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're going to pass Israel aid under different metrics. Like a lot of the stuff, the reason like the Senate stuff was like separated from the border stuff was because of complaints from the House. But I'm pretty sure the Speaker of the House was like very clear that they were happy to fund Israel. And this was something that got like tripped up in the Senate, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. I mean, maybe it's over amount. Maybe it's over optics. I mean, it's an election year and you have a lot of people worried about money, worried about foreign aid. And like the money not being yeah. used for domestic stuff. And so I think that was part of the optics issue, like with the border specifically is like, oh, if we're actually going to get money like uh, freed up to be used for something domestic, we have to send like even more money abroad, you know? And so I think, um, you know, 
I mean, potentially it's an optics thing too of being like, oh, well, we'll, we'll, you know, reject foreign aid, but they'll bundle it a different way and, and send it off. You know, I mean, we, Israel for the past like several decades has gotten yeah, billions so of money. dollar a year in aid. Um, and they've been called out by like U.S. intelligence and the U.S. military on multiple occasions for like using a lot of that military aid they get um, at, by like sending uh, weapons tech, like sensitive weapons tech and other things like that uh, to you know, U.S. adversary states yeah, Chinese. in China, you know. And you have all these Republicans that are like huge Israel simps, but they're also huge China hawks, and they like don't talk about that at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's very weird, you know. There's so, so much um, they don't talk about, where especially with like with the Maxwell thing, like they love like the salacious Epstein Ghislaine thing going on. But if you look mm -hmm. into his dad, like the stuff in your book, like I I was alive for it, but I was young. This shit with John Tower being connected, is nuts. this is nuts. Yeah. Like how how yeah. this isn't a story. That's up there, like, with Epstein renting a house from the State Department. This dude, John Maxwell, comes to America, somehow gets, like, newspapers or whatever, but he hooks up with some PR guys and this senator, John Tower, and he sells out, like, Whitney, do you remember, like, he sells out, like, nuclear secrets or something to Los Alamos or something? Yeah, basically what happened is that John Tower was like longtime head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he was leaving that post. And so he was looking for like new post post Senate lucrative opportunities. And he and he Henry Kissinger was communicating this to Robert Maxwell. R.I.P. Um, and Robert Maxwell sort of used Kissinger as an intermediary to basically offer um, a job to John Tower, but it was a uh, Mossad money. So John Tower was put on the Mossad payroll and was working for some of these Maxwell linked companies because Maxwell was trying to market this thing called the promise software, um, which had been, <laughs> we, don't, scary shit. we don't like talking about promise. It's scary. Once we learned <laughs> about promise, he was like explaining it to me and I was like, ah, oh, that's the stuff. We yeah. should probably yeah. stop talking the about The Danny well, Casalero how... thing is so scary. Yeah, it's pretty disturbing. So is Israel and and also the CIA basically had like a global coup because of Promise, uh, but mainly, I guess you could say it was mainly Israel in the sense that Israel backdoored Promise first and then sold it to intelligence agencies and security agencies around the world and so had a real-time backdoor into everything those intelligence and security agencies were doing. So they had like all this foreknowledge of like all these spy secrets and like military moves and all this stuff and it wasn't just for like the west it was also for like the soviet union and in, in you know places like that that weren't necessarily part of the Do west but the west was also targeted and in order to access u.s nuclear secrets they used john tower to basically open the door to los alamos and i think sandia national laboratory was the other one and they installed promise and then israel took all the nuclear secrets yeah there, um, there's so if i mean if I, I'm the, what I understand is they had Jonathan Pollard, right? This that dude. Mm -hmm. Remember, I was telling you about the dude Rafi Atan, and he thinks yeah. U.S. is like enemy soil. Right. They had Jonathan Pollard. Then they had they had another one. Oh, Vince Foster. He was selling shit. He was selling mm -hmm. nuclear shit. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Vince Foster, Pollard, and the the John Tower one I never heard of before. But I mean, that's three yeah, on that's record. That's part of the Maxwell thing. Maxwell yeah. and Tower go together, and they were also they all were all both killed the same year, nineteen ninety one, yeah. which John is also when Casalero dies, and uh, when one of Casalero's sources died. And there, nineteen ninety one was a big cover up year because they also pardoned all the Iran Contra criminals. Uh, they covered up the collapse of BCCI. Yeah, this is Bush, and all right? This interrelated stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not big dude. cover up here. William Barr oversaw that. He was Trump's attorney general more recently, but he was attorney general the first time under Bush Senior when all of this stuff was covered up. He's like a career CIA mop up man, William Barr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like they when they steal the nuclear secrets, like how does that just like kind of go away? And like because I feel like I hear it get brought up to like pundits and stuff, and they're just like, that's not real. Or they're like, well, because oh, we Israel's don't. never admitted they have nuclear weapons, yeah, but everyone yeah. knows they do. Do you you know, you know the um I, ultimate liars? I think you say it, Coburn, but it's spelled Cockburn. Like the family of the British family of journalists, like they wrote the Dangerous mm -hmm. Liaisons book. Like, what do you think about those guys? Are they like limited hangout or what? Like Alexander, Cockburn? yeah, Alexander and Andrew and Les or Leslie, I think. Um, I mean, if 
I, I'm not as familiar with their work now as maybe I was a few years ago. Um, but I feel like they're sort of, from what I recall, I feel like um, at least Alexander Cockburn's sort of one of those Chomsky guys where like he's right about some stuff and you're like, he has other viewpoints where you're like, how do you yeah reach right those conclusions, you know? Yeah. But I can't remember that much specific stuff because I don't really, um, I don't know. It's been a while since I've like read other people's like stuff, you know? Because <laughs> I, I like have done a lot of like writing of my stuff lately, like this monstrous book we're talking. Are you about. writing another book? Uh, I'm writing. Uh, well, I'm going to start writing another book. Well, it's sort of a little bit started, yeah, but it's on uh, some other stuff that it's probably going to be folded into a lot of the uh, things I wanted to cover in volume two specifically, but kind of ran out of time to cover, which has a lot more to do with like Epstein and banking and financial crimes and stuff like that. I mean, I allude to some of it, like talking about Epstein and BCCI and money laundering and sort of his early forays with banks. But I, as far as Epstein goes in volume two, I kind of stop like mm, maybe around um, like the early 2000s. And so I didn't really get into like financial crash stuff or some of this, the stuff with like Epstein and JP Morgan and Epstein and Deutsche Bank. Cause all of that comes after, you know, and I think it's going to end up involving some of that. But the the book uh, originally was planned to be about um, this Bahamian bank, Dell Tech, that's part of the FTX scandal. Um, one of the main, you know, banks for Tether, the stable coin. Yeah, I don't and, know much uh, about finances. Yeah, one. I think one of those, the JP Morgan ship that had a bunch of cocaine on it was seized outside <laughs> of Philly. And there was like tons of yeah. cops at the port and shit. It was insane. Yeah, I mean, they get away with literally anything. You know, I mean, they can steal a bunch of people's money and they're like, well, you That's know, I like, mean, it's like that South Park episode where they just go and it's gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. And like nothing <laughs> happens. You know, I mean, that's basically like the big four, big five banks in the U.S. operate like that. They're like completely unaccountable to anybody. And that shit's like super disheartening. Like once you start looking in this stuff, it's like, yeah, they stole nuclear secrets and then just denied it. Like everything, like it kind of like yeah. flattens your tires a little bit. Well, a little bit, but also it's important to understand why. And I guess I would say that the reason why is because, and I try and show this like in the book, specifically volume one, when you understand like where these different actors come from, what they share is like the same overarching, like organized crime club. Like yeah, they're it's kind of like a, it's like, you, like a family Bible of the mob. You know, like when you open up and you see like a family tree, yeah. it's like from Meyer Lansky and then it takes you all the way to Epstein. It's cool, man. Like, she was talking about the Claremont Club, and then, dude, they get into, like, they had their own rackets of, like, sexual blackmail. There's all this, like, weird shit you never even heard of. There's one called Page Boy, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> dude, and they get, like, high school kids to get work for them. It's out in the open. Yeah, Congressional Page. And that's why it's called the Page Boy Scandal, because, like, they got all these, uh, well, they were basically, like, yeah, diddling high schoolers. Like, dude, like, West, mm -hmm. like, Ohio resident, Les Waxner. Yeah. He had a mentor, Max Fisher. That dude was friends with Mitt Romney's dad. Mitt, Mitt Romney's dad was the governor of Michigan. Epstein chilled in Michigan when he was little at an art camp. Yeah, it's crazy shit. If you like, make a map in your head. It's wild. That like when I I watched that uh, the House of Maxwell thing. Like, what is the deal? Like, he stole a bunch of money, but is that why he got killed? Because he took out all those loans, or like, I'm I'm like an idiot. So I have no. Well, idea. I think he got killed for promise, probably. Uh. there's like all sorts of different theories about why. So like some of the main books on Robert Maxwell, like um, Robert Maxwell, Israeli super spy, for example, uh, that argues that it was because he had sort of run out of capital to keep his business empire afloat because he'd expanded more than he could afford to expand. Right. And so he started having like some capital problems. And so he made threats to Mossad mainly um, that he unless he like got more money from them, he was going to like spill shit. And that's allegedly why he was killed. And even uh, Ghislaine Maxwell has said that he was killed by Mossad renegades. <laughs> so that's what she thinks. You know, what's weird is like um, you can talk to these people. Like, did you talk? Did you talk to Ben Menashe? Ari Ben Menashe. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him probably like two or three times. Yeah. The, yeah. The other book, there's this guy, the bo other book I'm reading, um, I can't remember what it's called, but the guy's name is Gordon Thomas, but he interviews like old, old Mossad dudes. They'll talk. 
Jeez. Yeah, it's crazy. Some of well, yeah, Gordon Thomas had like a very long conversation with Rafi Atan, who's the guy that was like yeah. handling Robert Maxwell and Promise, handling Jonathan Pollard. I mean, really running all of this shit. Dude, he in just the strolled 80s and in 90s, and it was all targeting America. And um, Rafi the guy Atan, that was in charge of oh, sorry, mm-hmm. Rafi Atan just put on a disguise and strolled in and stole Promise software. <laughs> Allegedly, that's what the Gordon Thomas dude says. Yeah, yeah. Like a glass well, there's, and a there's multiple yeah. sources attesting to that, like it, including the guy that created Promise, uh, Bill Hamilton, like met Rafi Atan in disguise and then was like, oh, yeah, that was him. <laughs> yeah, you he's know? in disguise. And then Rafi like, Atan admits it later. To it's Gordon hilarious. Thomas. It sounds like, like yeah, a YouTube prank. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, that's what it's like. And then was like, uh, was Promise the stuff that like they could just go into all your, it was like the first thing that like crunched all your data together and they could just take like all of your emails in mass. Or are they just yeah, like it's basically the early version of what Palantir is today. Oh man, I don't Palantir's another freaky one. Yeah, they're bizarre. Yeah, well it's a it's a direct line from Promise to Palantir. It's yeah, the same so they people. had they had this other thing that they wanted to start called the TIA. Literally just wanted to fucking I don't even know. Can you can you explain it? It's a bill. Absolutely. Uh, so you. after nine eleven, <laughs> um, they tried to create this program called Total Information Awareness that was a public private partnership housed within DARPA, which is the Pentagon's research arm. And the guy they tried to put in charge of it was John Poindexter, who's one of these guys from Iran Contra, probably the highest ranking guy prosecuted for Iran Contra, but then he's pardoned by Bill Barr and whatever. And he's considered to be the godfather of modern surveillance. And uh, Poindexter was going to run this program TIA where basically they were going to data mine and like suck up everyone's data and then, you know, analyze it and look for patterns and whatever. And so it was basically always intended to have this pre-crime functionality, but they also had like sub programs, like one called bio surveillance that were about like detecting pandemics before they happen and all of this stuff. And a lot of that same technology uh, that was proposed under TIA was actually implemented during this? COVID by HHS. Dude, they started oddly this enough. way back. Um, what year is this? Uh, so TIA was being fielded probably around 2002, 2003. And then it was defunded by Congress not that long after it launched because there was a lot of pushback because it was accurately described as the end of privacy um, and would just yeah. like completely eliminate the fourth but amendment. Then, so oh. it was uh, defunded on those grounds, but then they decide that they can get around it <laughs> by launching TIA as a completely private enterprise, as opposed to like, if they take the military out of it, people won't complain. Yeah, and that's yeah. what they do. Dude, I just got so fucked Peter by Thiel, this. Yep. After he makes pay, uh, you know, finishes with PayPal, the PayPal up with mafia. this guy he knows from, yeah, it's very real. Teals up with this guy he knows from college named Alex Carp from Stanford. Pretty spooky school overall. And these guys uh, go and meet with Poindexter. Uh, they're trying, openly trying to recreate total information awareness. And they started creating Palantir as TIA was coming under a lot of pressure. So when TIA first came under pressure, they changed their name from total information awareness to terrorist information awareness. Exactly. And they'd be like, oh, we're just hunting for yep. terrorists, even oh, though they like obviously were like, we want it all, you yeah. know? And like literally the logo uh, of TIA of the program was like, an all seeing eye pyramid, like beaming yeah. out of the eye, the I whole mean, planet. Palantir. Like we're watching the whole planet. I mean, Bill just the saw Lord of the Rings. Information. Yeah. I just watched all three Lord <laughs> of the Rings extended editions. Not that it's a big deal, but yeah, yeah they, but it's like, I have Sauron stuff. I mean, yeah, that's why the Palantir stones. is Palantir too. You know what I mean? Like it's literally, literally that. They're and such Palantir nerds is... with this shit too. Like fucking <laughs> well, Bill totally. Barr. Bill Barr. I don't know if it's for real. Like what's this thing with Bill Barr? He has like a code name and his code name's Robert Johnson. And he's telling Bill, he's telling Bill. And I Cl- ran Contra. Yeah. He's yeah. telling Bill Clinton. Like Bill Clinton's like the young guy they're grooming for yeah. like fucking be big head honcho guy. mean Arkansas. And he just goes, we are the new, go- we are the new covenant. We're the new government. Dude. Like it's crazy, dude. Yeah. Those those dudes piss me the fuck off. Whenever we start talking about this, I get so annoyed by them because like, well, they just steal stuff from movies and like it's the same <laughs> stuff with Elon Musk. Like the dude just pretends like everything he does is just from fucking sci fi movies and books, but like they have like legit dude, effects on everyone. Tim Dillon, Tim Dillon was just talking to uh, Theo Vaughn. He was like joking around about like in the future you're gonna have it's gonna be di- so dystopian. Like you'll have a hospital in your house. But in the book, like Whitney writes about this chick, Melanie Walker, which will blow your fucking mind. This chick was, she was like one of Ghislaine's henchmen 
And then she's a World Economic Forum chick. She's a neuroscientist. She fucked Prince Andrew for a couple of days. Dude, it's wild. Three, she, three uh, she's married Brits. to a top Microsoft guy. He's now at Andreessen Horowitz, I believe. Um, and that dude was yeah, on she Rogan. she was Bill Gates' main science advisor after she was Epstein's science advisor. She's, like, obsessed with transhumanism. And, and she says you're going to have a hospital stuff. in your house by 2030. This is, like, part of the thing. Like it's called a homespital. <laughs> <laughs> they come up with good names. Yeah, they the all, the, like, that weird uh, data collection, they just got me with the IRS. Like, I logged on, and I had to get, like, some sort of form. And it was ID me, and I was like, all right, like, obviously scan my face because the iPhone has got me so used to scanning my face. And then he did it, and I was like, dude, that's uh, that's optional. That's I just a different company. Yeah, it's just an Israeli company. It's an Israeli company that scans your whole face and gets your biometrics, and they're like, oh, you can use it for everything, and there's not one practical use to it. Yeah. Well, there will be. Um, Killing. You know, me. I mean... You know how world coin works, right? You like scan your eyeball and then you get shit coins and a cattle tag. I'm good you know? on that. <laughs> like a digital ID or whatever. Um, and then you get like useless tokens. Yeah. So basically um, the way the UN is setting up all their refugee assistance is that same shit. And they, but they were doing it like well before world coin even launched. Um, so, like, basically, you know, for, like, Syrian refugees in Jordan, for Ukrainian refugees and stuff, it's or displaced people, uh, if the World Food Program is there, the way those refugees and, like, vulnerable people get their rations is they have to scan their eyeball. It's so fucked and up. And then <laughs> they have set up, like, supermarket-style places where people can pick out their rations and feel, you know, like they're buying food. But you go to checkout and you scan your eyeball – and then whatever you have bought, the value of it is deducted from your wallet that's tied to your biometric digital ID. And, uh, yeah, and they say it's because people were defrauding the system, but there's no evidence of that. So what it's really about um, is this whole, you know, digital ID thing they've been flushing out for a long time that more people became aware of during COVID. And the goal, um, as practiced by the World Food Program and also by, like, ID2020, and uh, they mainly have tested it on refugees thus far, it's also supposed to be a repository for all your health data, um, all your education credentials, career credentials, like your resume, you know, all of this stuff stored in one place. And I think, uh, I mean, actually, they're pretty open about, you know, that they plan to make it necessary for more services, like your access to government services, your access to your uh, to telecommunications, uh, you know, like your cell cell phone provider or whatever, uh, your internet service provider, all of that, your social media accounts. So, you know, obviously the possibility that arises then is like, okay, what if you post something wrong on social media and they like, you know, deduct from your ration wallet? Yeah, I mean, we're fried. Yeah, that, I would yeah. be fucked. I would have zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's obviously not a good system, but they they test it on refugees first, and and it's basically like what they intend to do. So like all this collecting of biometric data, um, you know, people are like, oh shit, I just gave that away. Well, it doesn't really matter if you give it away or not because I mean they have it. So like Facebook, for example, your Facebook pictures have been used to. Uh, train and, and create basically this company called Peter, uh, sorry, called a uh, Clearview AI that is backed by Peter Thiel, just like Facebook was backed by Peter Thiel. And he's the Palantir guy, remember? And uh, yeah, so they have your faces, even if you didn't upload the pictures, like they can identify other people that don't have Facebook accounts that are just in other people's Facebook pictures. What's the and if you like consider what's coming now with like Apple Vision Pro and all these VR headsets, which have yeah. like, how many cameras in them? Yeah, right. Yeah, there's you know? like 18 it's, or some shit. Yeah. That's not just about like getting the biometrics of the person wearing that stuff. They're collecting all of that data with those fancy cameras off of everyone they walk past on the street and like interact with, you know? Yeah, they had so a like, homer with like the ring cameras and stuff because we're in Philly and it's on like every single front step is a camera every five feet. It yeah, is, it's like wild. China. Like, it's the same thing, but, like, everyone actually buys the security cameras and puts it up for the government. Yeah, it's called plausible deniability. That way they don't, they don't, the military's not doing it. They just Genius. get one of their boys. But I think the guys that got, the guys that started all this shit were, like, old, like, the PNAC crew. Like, the Rand, the Rand Corporation yeah. guys. Mm -hmm. So, like, they are the military. Yeah. What the fuck? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
I mean, it's the same like deep state responsible for that, that people, you know, are mad about running the country, but they willingly like, yeah, they'll get on Musk's their dick. products and like, you know, have them surveil their home and give them all their data. That's that why it's like Elon's for, like, like pre-crime you know, stuff. Elon's like, I got Twitter. Say whatever you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a trap. Are you not? Yeah, are you can not we big talk on about Musk? that for a second? Because that shit is like this like, is the ultimate honeypot. Whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to talk digital honeypots. You want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, because I think it's kind of important. You know what I mean? Like this whole thing of like, oh, you're free to say whatever you want here. I mean, they tried that shit with what was it called, like Parlor or whatever, and then January six happens. Dude, you they know, had a thing called like, Yak. Over all the data. <laughs> they had a thing called Yak before that when I was in college, and it was an anonymous thing that was local, and you could say whatever the fuck you want anon- <laughs> anonymously. Yeah. And people were just, like, telling on drug dealers down the street. It was, like, kind of nuts, but, yeah, it is fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if that's yeah, a deal with Honey Pot. No, go on about good. Elon, because I, I keep telling Bill, like, I read, I read like, the new uh, Elon book, like, biography or whatever the guy put out, and Simple. I want to do a, a podcast on Elon, because him and Kimball are hilarious, like, <laughs> And Kimball is Eskimo Bros with Epstein, by the way. Yeah, that's weird. Down in uh, mm-hmm. but anyway, um, also Trump and Epstein, Eskimo Bros did not know who? that. Who? This chick, um, Selena Middlefart. It's hilarious on, name. I feel like you guys are making up last names. Unless right. Whitney made it no, up, it's in her book. That's actually her <laughs> last name. Poindexter, Cockburn, and Middlefart. I thought Poindexter was kind of a slam, like because that's like a nerd. Yeah, but it comes way. It's from Felix the Cat. It's way before that dude was. Okay, yeah. I'll let it slide. Anyway, go on about Elon. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's really just about the honeypot thing in general. So I think there's this whole effort, you know, this war on domestic terrorism we've heard a lot about, but not a lot has happened there yet. And it's all based uh, on, like, you know, social media posts and things like that and, like, thought crime and all of this stuff. And they're, like, setting up the infrastructure for that. But a lot of people, um, a lot of the platforms that those particular people are being pushed to use are funded by the same people setting all this shit up. Yeah. So, like, let's take Rumble, for example. Like, Rumble's a big, like, Peter Thiel-funded thing, but Peter Thiel is the guy creating Palantir, which is being used by all the intelligence agencies to profile people based on their data. Like, they decide if you're a subversive or not. Like, they openly use that label, and they're op- they've are they openly been uh, doing, like, pre-crime stuff, which they call predictive policing for, like, years and years and years, and they're being used for, like, openly for the war on domestic terror stuff. You know? So, when, like, a thing feels just right for me, yeah. and it's like they created the app for me to go on it's probably not real or it's probably, probably a not honeypot. real yeah well they're saying like oh this is an open square like this is free speech but like what is elon doing at twitter why he's saying all of that well first of all it's not actually free speech because he and linda yaccarino play good cop bad cop all the time and she's yeah. like freedom of speech not freedom of reach and he's like i'm woke and based and red pill yeah, yeah. And people are i like, hate oh, the yeah, adl okay. <laughs> yeah we'll keep trusting elon a little bit longer and his id verification yeah his id verification system is like an israeli company company that like wants your license exactly and he's been pushing ever since he bought it to uh turn it into what he called you know basically openly saying he wants to turn it in into an american equivalent of wechat yeah um which is complicated for its own reasons um but aside from that he's he's been saying you know verify all humans and he says it's about eliminating the bot problem which i guarantee you it's not um but Verify All Humans is about linking your a government issued ID to your social media account. And this has been promoted by people like Jordan Peterson, Nikki Haley, like all these like people in all conservative the cool land on both sides of, you know, whether it's Neocon or MAGA, like there's people in all those spheres that have been pushing for this lately. And Elon Musk is one of them. And it's because of it's for this broader agenda to criminalize speech because they probably already know who you are, even if you have like an anonymous account on twitter or whatever but the problem is once they you link your government issued id to it like they can prosecute you for it if they want so they're like like like, it opens i mean dude he's legal window for that he's all about free speech except for his papa and his dad's podcast yeah yeah, have you ever seen his dad's (laughs) podcast no i don't know if i want to it's like father of a genius or something yeah Yeah, He, he, he told his dad to stop doing his podcast or uh he doesn't get any more money his dad's like saying he's a complete, wow. complete liar, absolute Called, bitch. He gets on Twitter, call, keeps commenting on Elon's post, limp dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't know that. They're definitely a really messed up family. Like Elon's mom is like totally insane. Also, 
Um, oh, yeah. Also, like I think satanic even creepier shit. than the dad, honestly. The Haldemans, they're weirdos, dude. Yeah, I don't. It really does yeah. sound like a Robert Heinlein book, like his background. That's why I'm like, dude, something's up. Because this dude's just living out like a weird, out in the open fantasy. Like, oh, I, I was just a 12 year old. I made video games. It's yeah. like, that was probably cool, man. Do you do you know anything about the Edge Edge uh, group or what is it called? Totally, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I write about, about it in Edge, the book. Yeah, obviously, absolutely. I'm not much of a weird that, like, reader. Sorry, <laughs> that's all Stan. <laughs> no, that's like Stanford. Edge is like a lot of Stanford people. Yeah, well, Stanford has a lot of overlap with PayPal Mafia too, and I mean, it, you know, in Silicon Valley in general. Um, but the Edge Foundation, you know, is basically the baby of John Brockman, who was like the science publisher and one of those guys that like sort of made. Uh, various academic scientists like celebrities, Steven Pinker and, and guys like that by did like you ever, their books out. And, did you ever see the documentary The Net? I think it's called about um the Unabomber. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. They starts out with John Brockman like getting interviewed. And it's from like the early 2000s. It's really weird. Yeah, I tried to note in the book that Brockman is like obviously a spooky guy and like doing some weird stuff as early as the 90s, uh, early 90s. And he teams up with Epstein sometime in like, I don't know, I think it's like roughly 1995 or so is when they start orbiting each other. And eventually Epstein becomes like the main donor to Edge, Edge, some years the only donor. Yeah. And he is basically the money behind their annual billionaires dinner where you have like all the Silicon Valley big wigs and a lot of... Um, very influential and, and very wealthy people coming together to just talk about did, science. Yes, yeah, cool. Smart they did are you did you see the other. um? Did you see the, like the giant the long clock they're making? That dude, there's a dude, Danny Hillis from the Danny Thinking Hillis, Machines. He's very close with Epstein. Yeah, yes, he's, he's making he used the to longest run this supercomputer company called Thinking Machines. Yeah, that was very tied up with DARPA and very spooky. Eric yeah. Lander came out of there, who's like the creepy eugenicist guy that Biden put in charge of all science policy, and then got fired for sexual harassment or something like that. Yeah, he's like he a came eugenicist. Out of Thinking Machines. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of other guys did too, but Danny Hillis is interesting, yeah, because he teams up with Nathan Mervold, who's like former chief technology officer of Microsoft with Bill Gates, who was like very close to Epstein in the late nineties, and like Epstein was accompanying him on like big uh, Microsoft yeah, business trips. Yeah, Be- Bezos yeah, gave Microsoft him, Russia and stuff. Mm-hmm. Bezos gave Danny Hillis forty two million dollars to build a giant clock with Brian Eno. It makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but. You know, what's weird is that all these guys have, like, Epstein and Maxwell as, like, underlying, like, common denominators. Like, Jeff Bezos, super cozy with Ghislaine Maxwell, hung out with Epstein. Uh, Epstein, on the night of the 2016 election, was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia with Jeff Bezos. No one really seems to, like, think about that, yeah. about that one very Crazy. Much. Why was <laughs> any uh, thoughts on why that no was No idea on? what they were doing, but that's supposedly around the time when uh, Jeff massages. Bezos' WhatsApp was hacked. If you guys remember oh, that, yeah, it, like yeah. broke apart his marriage and stuff. Was Epstein involved with that? I don't know. It Damn. was really spyware that did it. So. Only hear it here. Damn, and they blamed that <laughs> on the Saudi prince or whatever, right? Yeah, who, uh, if you remember, and a lot of people have forgotten, but when Epstein was arrested in 2019, there were a bunch of stories about how Epstein's house was littered of pictures with pictures of him and Mohammed bin Salman. Do you think that the there place. is anything weird about how, like, I don't know how to put this into words, but, like, Khashog- the, the young Khashoggi got killed, and it had something to yes. do with, like, Pegasus, but then his uncle, yeah, you know, can you... Adnan Khashoggi. Do you understand yeah. what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, so let me try and unpack what I think. Because, I I mean, remember how I said I didn't really, beyond volume two, I didn't really get to go into Epstein's stuff beyond 2000, and there's, like, a lot more there. Yeah. Uh, So this is part of it. So uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who's the guy that was uh, allegedly killed in in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, um, or... Maybe it was another Turkish city in Turkey. Anyway, um, doesn't matter. His his uncle was Adnan Khashoggi, who was a big big time weapons dealer guy, tied up with like uh, the money networks that involved the Bush family, for example. Uh, tied up with the same, you know, Iran Contra crowd. He was on the Mossad payroll, CIA payroll, tons of intelligence agency payrolls. Honestly, I think French intelligence as well. Just like probably like five or six agency payrolls like at a given time and was and it had like a yacht that Trump bought later. Yeah, that Trump was bought like, his yacht. He used dude. it for sex bl- blackmail and all the stuff. Trump did? Um, dude, Trump don't. Trump bought the yacht after Khashoggi had it. I mean, it, it, there's no proof necessarily that he used it for the same purpose as Khashoggi did, but Khashoggi yeah. was like known to 
engage in sex blackmail stuff too because i mean people assume uh because of the whole epstein thing that like sex blackmail must just be like an intelligence agency thing or no 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 no. uh (laughs) the intelligence agencies got these all these tactics from like the mob because they teamed up with the mob yeah like during world war ii like openly and so they just basically were like well this shit works so let's just use it and so I've had a, There's all had, these private enterprises that do it too. I had it's a heavy, work. I had a heavy microdose the one day I was reading. Um, the there's this chapter called Roy Cohn's Favor Bank, and like, dude, by the time I was done, I was like, my heart was pounding, <laughs> just because it's too wild. Like, dude, he had this hotel in New York, and he was just having, he had like these suites where he was just blackmailing fucking everybody. Just having parties with all these youngsters. This is Donald Trump's mentor. Yes. Yeah. Roy Cohn. And Roy yeah. Cohn is like pulling all these strings. He's friends with like William H. Buckley, Barbara Waters. Like he thinks he's the man. All these dudes think they're the man for a while, but then bottom drops out. Yeah. I mean, well, Roy Cohn was the bridge between the legitimate world and the illegitimate world of like organized crime. You know, he's like a lawyer for all these mob bosses, but he's also like hanging out at the White House with Ronald Reagan. Right. And stuff. Anyway, you know, get back to Khashoggi. Sorry. Sorry, I derailed that. <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I mean, it's a thousand page book, you know, so it it happens. Don't worry. But basically, yeah. So the Khashoggi guy uh, is part, Jamal Khashoggi was part of this family um, that was like very, very much connected to intelligence. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi himself was embedded with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which of course was CIA financed through Operation Cyclone, which started under Carter, continued through Reagan, and I believe Bush Sr. as well, and is where Al Qaeda um, came out of, right? So Jamal Khashoggi is embedded with them, uh, along with some other spooky people at, at the time, but that's how his journalist career started, right? And um, <clears throat> uh, he's wor- writing for the Washington Post. I, I think at the time, Jeff Bezos had bought the Washington Post as well. Yep. Yes, um, but there's there's more, in- but, but basically the Khashoggi thing happened um, at a time, or, well, basically the, the end result of it uh, was that Mohammed bin Salman went from being media darling to like completely isolated and basically like a Kim Jong-un, you know? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, that was the end result at the end of the day, right? So why would they want to like bring MBS down a peg? Um, I think it's because if you think about how Mohammed bin Salman came to power, it was very uncharacteristic. Saudi princes or, you know, Saudi crown princes are very rarely as young as Mohammed bin Salman was. They're usually old dudes. It's not like it's a monarchy, right? But it's not like a father to son monarchy like most people think about in the West or like it used to be maybe in medieval times in the West and, and things like that. Instead, it's more it's like a more seniority thing. It's like passed around like the uncles, Right. Um, and it's like a seniority thing, not necessarily like a genetic, uh, you know, father son thing. So um, the guy that had been crowned prince before Mohammed bin Salman is this guy named Mohammed bin Nayef, who was very close to CIA director John Brennan. Very close. Scumbag. I mean, John Brennan, before he was CIA director, <laughs> was station chief for the CIA in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so he was, com- he basically set up the existing power structure of Saudi Arabia and then Brennan, whoever dude. brought MBS to power tears all of that down. And MBS was like hanging his rivals upside down in the Ritz Carlton, like literally like torturing <laughs> them and shaking them down for money. I don't know if you guys remember that. No, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, but there was, it was called like the purge or something like all this weird shit was going on when now, MBS came to power. Do you think there's anything, this is like completely, <laughs> this is just crazy. off the rails, but <laughs> Do you think there was anything weird that went on with Las Vegas and like all that, like the the theories that there were like Saudi princes above that dude or is that? I've heard that. I've heard theories involving like Saudi princes and Sheldon Adelson and stuff like that. I mean, obviously Las Vegas is like mob city numero uno, you yeah. know what I mean? So like, I'm sure there was a lot of shady stuff that went on there and obviously it wasn't properly investigated. I have not done my own investigation of right. that. <laughs> Though I know that the there leads. was a, it's a little goofy you know, for you. <laughs> There was a, there, there's still like, I know they're still blocking like doc, like documents and like data about what happened at the Las Vegas shooting, like in terms of like helicopter stuff and whatever, like they still like won't release that. So that's obviously sus. So, but I can't really comment beyond that. No, no, no problem. The, uh, the Khashoggi thing, like, does anyone know or like, what is your theory for why he got killed? To knock Bin Salman so, down a peg. 
I think it was, I think it was, I think this is part of a broader war that also doesn't just include the Jamal Khashoggi thing. It also includes Epstein being arrested the second time, because I think Epstein was one of the figures responsible for the rise of Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. And so if you are Epstein and you take out John Brennan's top golden boy in Saudi Arabia, John Brennan is going to effing hate you. Whoa. Yeah. Especially if, if you're affiliated with a different power faction at the time, which Epstein was definitely not part of the Brennan orbit at that point in time. I think Epstein vacillated between those factions a few times in his career, but at least at this point he was in a different one, definitely closer to the Israeli side of things. Um, and I think Mohammed bin Salman was definitely um, part of his, in, in Israeli effort to normalize uh, economic relations specifically with the Gulf states, which has happened in a huge way under Trump. And one of the main point, one of the main point men for that was Jared Kushner, Jared Kushner known to be yeah. texting MBS all the time. The best <laughs> buddies, Adam Newman, the grifty, we work guy, Mohammed <laughs> bin Salman and Kushner. were trying to solve Middle East conflict. I don't know we if you guys hilarious. remember I re that, We have the Kushners that's here. That's the, the world peace team guy. The, the Kushner, uh, Kushner's build, building a giant building down here in Philly. It's called the noble. Which yeah. is hilarious. That's what he named it. But I did you see that thing where he's building in one of the Gulf states? It's like the city that's just a straight line. Yeah, it's like one rail that goes all the way through the desert. Yeah, for, I think it's called the line, literally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were going to make this city called Neom in Saudi Arabia, and it seems like they decided not to do that, and they're doing this line city. But it's all to like, like MBS came to power, right? And his main thing was Vision Twenty Thirty, which is Fuck. basically like sustainable goals on. Yeah. Uh, on overdrive type of stuff, like <laughs> post-oil Saudi Arabia. You know what I mean? So yeah. that means like fourth industrial revolution, Web3 Saudi Arabia, basically smart city Saudi Arabia. And I think Epstein was one of the masterminds of that because one of the first things they did when they announced, when MBS announced Vision 2030 was he gave this robot citizenship. Sophia the robot. <laughs> That's hilarious. And that robot is made by Hanson Robotics. Uh, the chief science, like the guy that made that is it's John Hanson and Ben Gertzel. And those are those that's Epstein territory. They do like the, Ben Gertzel is like Epstein's top science guy, one of them. What are your thoughts on clones? <laughs> on clones? I mean, I don't know. We brought up the Nick uh, Bryan. He was like, it's think not that hard. Weird shit that happens. Dude, I just that, watched King of sure. Clones on Netflix. It's crazy, dude. And Epstein was talking about the the who's that one dude that was collecting eggs? He was creeping on those black chicks. Remember oh, that? Fuck, what's that guy's name? Nygard. Peter Nygard. Nygard. Peter Nygard. Yeah, dude's a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Anyway, there was a lot of really weird stuff happening with that. And I honestly still don't know what to make of it. But really quick to wrap up the thought I had, I think there was faction competition between the John Brennan crowd and whatever crowd Epstein was in, which seems to be like whatever crowd Jared Kushner was in, which is probably the Netanyahu crowd, you know? Right. And so you're having those guys fight for, uh, I don't trust that guy Netanyahu. and stuff. Um, so anyway, I think that's part of, uh, the Khashoggi thing was part of that struggle between those factions, along with the whole Jeff Bezos blackmailing, leaking of his personal stuff, wrecking his marriage, all that stuff. Um, just a lot of weird things going on. And I think Epstein's arrest was probably part of that because there's no way he was arrested for sex trafficking. Yeah. In right. Yeah. They already knew all that stuff. It was covered up. They brought it back for some reason and, and some other reason. And it was probably related to either geopolitical or financial stuff. It's crazy when you it's, think about like how the big movements that they would do, like coups and shit. Oh yeah. Well, the the thing that like got mm -hmm. me into this was like 2016, like kind of when Trump was coming in, when all that shit went down with like WikiLeaks and Seth Rich and all that stuff. Like that mm -hmm. is the stuff that like that guy just got locked up for 40 years. Who? The guy from Vault Seven. For real? Yep. Yeah, what the fuck? Well, first of all, yeah, that guy, Josh Schultz, he denies he was the Vault 7 leaker, and the government doesn't actually have that much evidence that he was. Like, it's all very circumstantial, and it's mainly about, like, him having been on bad terms with the people he worked at at the CIA and then leaving. It doesn't really tie him to the stuff. He was just the fall guy they chose for it because Damn. they wanted to make an example of somebody. They don't really know who gave it to WikiLeaks. Also, um... A couple other things about Vault 7. Vault 7, whenever you hear in the next year or so, they blame there's some big cyber attack. Is this say, a prediction? Seems increasingly likely. <laughs> uh, no, but they can, Vault 7 shows that they can blame any country they want because the CIA has these tools where they can conduct a cyber attack 
but put in the fingerprints of any nation state. Right. And then it looks like it's them. So that's very important to keep in mind from Vault 7, like one of the most consequential things about it. And the other thing I want to say is that Trump said, I love WikiLeaks when he was campaigning yes. and benefited from them. And then he's the reason that Julian Assange is rotting away in a Britain prison. Right yeah, now. they were trying to kill him. For real? Yeah, they had like an assassination yeah. so attempt. Like Trump a plan. is one of these guys that has certain rhetoric when he's on the campaign trail, but he works for the deep state when he's in office. Him and Epstein I mean, had a calendar girl time. competition, dude. Not it gonna hurts, lie. Not gonna lie, he got me on the first run. <laughs> for this yeah, time, I'm I mean, not voting for fucking anyone, dude. I swear to God. I mean, yeah, because the thing is, if people want to like hope that Trump is different this time, I, you can't put all your eggs in that basket. It's very unlikely. And people have forgotten a lot of what happened during the Trump administration. This is a guy that put in John Bolton as national yeah. security advisor, the craziest war hawk ever. People say Trump didn't start any new wars. Well, I, well he tried to. They assassinated Qasem Soleimani, one of the top yeah. Iranian generals, to try and with, instigate a war with Iran. With dogs. They tried to coup <laughs> Venezuela, which would have created created a huge crisis in Latin America, which already like has a huge like yeah. issue with like Venezuelan, ma mainly Venezuelan immigrants. So you start a war coup in Venezuela, you're going to get like even more and destabilize the whole region. And warp they tried speed. to do all that warp stuff. Speed. I mean, warp speed hurt. Yeah, warp well, speed's where I got off the speed, train. <laughs> absolutely. And you had people that were like against the vaccine, but trying to also be pro-Trump like Alex Jones, who were like, oh, the vaccine's sugar water because Trump is making it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, dude. Yeah. Um, so people need to be very like wary, like remember what happened because our attention span because of just how media is set up today is like yeah, mosquito like size. Like Alex you Jones says I mean? we have goldfish brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean he <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just get really frustrated with him because I feel like that is why he's still successful. He's yeah. showing his ass right now know, with all yeah. that stuff with Twitter. Like, he's sucking Elon Musk's dick, and he's like, oh, it's disgusting. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he, well, I, yeah, because Alex Jones was someone who was like very against transhumanism and all this stuff, yeah. and now he's like sucking the D of brain chip, dude. Like, come on. Well, that's like, what, that's what I get sucked in because I have hope, and I'm like, no, no, the good guys are going to win. And then, like, remember, that's all we got. remember when I was like, dude, yeah, maybe well, it's RFK Jr., can and he's like, win, but we have to remember that the little Little people that aren't being pushed in front of us are the good guys. All of these other dudes are like manufactured heroes and celebrities. Yeah, you know what I mean. It, it, it's it's weird. like that Albert Pike guy being like, uh, every time the people want a hero, we will supply them. It's yes. like that kind of shit. You know, it is weird. Like out of nowhere, like they had him like bodied, and it's all that money from the Sandy Hook shit. Out of nowhere, Tucker Carlson's like, I'm going to leave Fox and I'm going to have Alex Jones on, get him reinstated. It's like they're gearing up for something that's going to happen around the election. Yeah, well, they are um, trying to make people think once again that Trump is the guy that's going to take down the quote unquote deep state. And so even cool if, if Trump did. were to do that or try or had the intention of doing that, in my opinion, there's no way one dude in the White House can do that. Yeah, yeah right. Because... So. People it's don't understand what the deep state is, and I think that's intentional, and I think a lot of people in quote-unquote independent media have misled people about what the, the, the deep state is. If you ask the average American or average Trump supporter to define the deep state, they'll be like, uh, Nancy Pelosi, you know, <laughs> or they'll just be like, everyone bad in the government. Yeah, is the deep state. And basically what the deep state is supposed to mean is it, it's supposed to be the bureaucracy that doesn't change regardless of who's put in power and elected. So if you think of, you know, appointees of uh, that, the executive branch makes like the president, you know, and you look at the intelligence community, OK, they pick CIA director, they, they pick the director of national intelligence. That's like two employees out of a workforce of thousands and thousands of people. It's 18 intelligence agencies. So how much really changes when one president comes in? Well, I definitely and if you look at history. Oh, mm -hmm. I, def I think we definitely know more now than when I was younger, man. Like I remember older guys at work being like trying to tell me like, dude, you know, like Clinton, he, he pardoned Mark Rich. And I was like, I don't know who the fuck that is. dude. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like people knew well, about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People know about the pardons. Like, the weird pardons they do is, like, another. Like, Trump pardoned a dude. He was in the... He pardoned Michael Milken, the Drexel Burnham Lambert junk bond king guy that's, like, been rehabilitated under COVID and, like, hosts Anthony Fauci roundtables and stuff. What? And is like, I care about your health, but I uh, 
totally fucked the economy in the late 80s and stole lots of money. An absolute re- redemption story. The president's just like, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how much power they actually have, but the president's just like, a, he's a front man. It's you know a figurehead, I mean? yeah. honestly. And we're made to think that as long as we get the right person in the office of the presidency, it's going to fix everything. That's not how this stuff works. You know, I mean, that's a pipe dream. But anyway, I don't think Trump can deliver on that because of how he was the first time. And we should definitely look just as much at a politician's actions than, than as their rhetoric, if not more so their actions and their rhetoric. So, for example, Trump comes into office the first time. He makes this poli- strategy and policy forum, I think it was called, um, of basically the people that are going to, like, you know, develop the North Star policies of his administration. It's Larry Fink. Oh, it's fuck. Jamie Dimon. It's like all those guys. They're busy, oh, yeah, they're busy Black in the Rock. Ukraine right now. BlackRock is the that's spooking me out once I found out about the British East India Company. And then thinking like this is just the modern day of that. That that's pretty fair. And you know, Trump uh when COVID started, who did he call right away to ask him what to do in times of crisis? He called Larry Fink. If that's going to be your go-to guy yeah. when shit hits the fan, um, that's a problem because what Larry think what Larry think thinks of when there is a crisis is Make how money. can I profit from this crisis and have BlackRock buy? It? 